One of the other things that happened at council when we were there, and um, it was something that was kind of special there, that uh, Rich and Kathy Brown were recognized for 50 years of licensed ministry in the Christian Missionary Alliance. And I lost Rich on the way back with Pastor Sean, so I, you know. Now, Rich is off in another conference for his interim uh, ministries that he's a, a part of, pastoral ministries, and it, most of you know through the history of Trinity, Rich did two stints here as interim pastor, and we appreciated that. It was uh, really an awesome thing and for them and Rich and Kathy to be here. And um, so um, after, after the service, uh, you can let uh, Kathy know what you think of Rich at that point. <laughs> so. If you have your Bibles, you get them open to uh, Philippians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be uh, um, spending a little bit of time there this morning. I want to uh, try to unpack for you this thing that Paul talks about in this chapter about contentment and what the secret of contentment is. But I want to I do that by first of all introducing this. Um, how many of you know what that is? How many of you had one of those growing up? I am so old. Most of you under the age of 45, 50 probably will not know what this is. You've probably never seen one until you saw it. My wife is looking at it like, I've never seen this thing. Uh, you've probably never seen this. This, this is, what is what was called the Major Matt Mason Space Kit. Okay? It was a precursor to Buzz Lightyear. Okay? Um, and, and what happened, this Mattel Corporation developed this toy in 1966, okay? I was six years old at the time, okay? Mo about half of you in this room weren't born yet, all right? And, and, and so uh, they, they developed this because at that time the space race was going on, all right? We were in a race against the Soviet Union to see who could get to the moon first. And Major Matt Mason, he was so cool because this dude lived on the moon. He had all the stuff, he had all these cool little things right here to pay. This thing right here, you, you put him inside of that, and that little uh, air pump thing, it would make it bounce on the table, you know, you could do all this stuff with it. He had all kinds of little things. They, Saturday morning cartoons, they would do a commercial of Major Matt Mason, right? And, and you'd see this and all the cool stuff he could do of like flying through the air and do all these things. And of course, being six years old, you had no idea what TV could do this stuff, right? And, and so, I, I had to have one of these. I, had to have, I went to my parents and says, I need a Major Matt Mason, because the TV told me I needed him, right? And so, so I, I'm going, my parents said, no, you can't have a Major Matt Mason. Oh, but my, I'll never ask you for anything again if you just let me have it. But no. Christmas, 1967. My grandparents, God bless grandparents, because not only do they give you things, but they fill your kids up with sugar, too. Anyway. My grandparents got me a Major Matt Mason set. Oh, I was so happy. I was content. I didn't need anything else. I took him, I set him up, I put him up there, put him in the little thing, bounced him around on the table, took the little jet pack thing and you tied a string up here high and then you slid him down the string and he flew through the air. This was so cool, like you were living like it was, he was on the moon and you were there for about two hours. <laughs> because then it started getting a little cumbersome to keep putting the string up all the time and, and you know, making things. Then the string would get tangled up and he'd flip and snarl and do all these kind of things. And the, the little hand pump thing kept falling off of the little suit and all that. And after about two hours, I was ready for something else. I wanted something else. I was no longer content with the Major Matt Mason. And I lied to my parents because I kept asking them for more stuff. kind of what we do, isn't it? We think we need a lot of stuff. We see a commercial or we see somebody has something and, and we border on coveting it maybe. And we say, I gotta have one. I gotta have that. I, my life will be so much better. I'll be so much happier if I just have this thing or if I can go to this place, if I can have this experience. 
then it would be great. My life would be full. And then we get there and we do it or we get the object or we go on that trip or whatever it is. And sometimes we come back disillusioned. We come back wondering, what did I miss? How, how, come, how come this is not helping me be content? Where did, where did the excitement go? After a little while, it wore off because perhaps maybe you never really understood what the true secret of contentment is. Maybe we define contentment in a way much like the world does. That contentment is found in things and in experiences when maybe contentment is really something else. And that's what I want to unpack for you this morning. And so as we dive into this passage, let me read for you. Well, in a month, before we read it, let me just uh, unpack for you what is going on here before we get into this passage. Paul is in Rome. He's in prison. He has done his missionary journeys, and, and now he is waiting trial before Caesar because he has appealed to Caesar. He's chained to a guard. He can't go anywhere and do anything. His freedom is severely limited. He doesn't have a lot of things. And so he, he is able to at least write, and he's able to write the Philippians. It's a church that he had founded as we, uh, back when we were looking at Acts chapter 16 and 17, we saw how, how Paul and Silas established the church in Philippi. And now he's writing to encourage them. He's thanking them for the gift which they sent him. And toward the end of this letter, Paul senses that it is necessary for him to share with them the secret of contentment. Not only does he thank him for the gift, but he, he says, I, I think I need to give you this little insight about how to be content because there's a time coming in your life and in your ministry and, and, and in, in, in your city that's going to want to suck contentment away from you. And so I want to share with you what the secret of that is. So let's pick this up at verse 10 of chapter 4 and follow along as I read I rejoice greatly in the Lord at last. You renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, all this, through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here in this passage, Paul gives us some clues as to what true contentment is and, and what the secret is to, to experience this contentment. To do that, I want to begin by going through what true contentment is not as we define this term contentment. First thing is true contentment is not fatalism. There was a Stoic philosophy during Paul's time, this time when he's in prison in Rome. And the Stoics would run around and they would say that, well, whatever just happens to you happens. And you can't really change it. You can't do anything about it. So you might as well just accept it. You might as 
to well just be content in your circumstances. It doesn't matter whether you evaluate them to see if maybe you're in sin or it doesn't matter if you evaluate them to see if maybe you've, you've interpreted something wrong. It just, just accept it and, and life is just fatalistic. You're at every whim and wish of life. That is not the contentment that Paul's talking about. You're not talking about just being content in circumstances for the sake of being content in circumstances. It's also not based on outward circumstances or objects. How long was I content with Major Matt Mason? Two hours, give or take. After that, it was on to something else. We, we, we fight, we claw, we scratch for things, and, and then we get them, and then we're still not happy because our motives perhaps were selfish, wrong, indifferent. In verse 12, Paul says that he has, in all things, learned to be content among them, whether in plenty or in want. So it's obviously not the objects or, or the situations, the circumstances that were giving Paul contentment because he was all over the map with those. Human definition of contentment is usually based on some form of this statement. That I will be content as long as I have a six-figure income and a house and three cars and 17,000 kids or whatever it is, right? We, we need more help in the church, Aaron, so, you know. <laughs> okay. This kind of definition can lead to people using people to get things instead of using things to love people and to bless them. If, if I've got to have this object and things, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it. If you get in my way, heaven help you. Because I'm going to get it. I don't care who I've got to run over to do it. It can, it can degrade into that. And it can degrade into other things. Integrity and truthfulness, etc. Honesty. It can go by the wayside. Because we've got to have it. Contentment is also not complacency. Complacency is uncritical satisfaction. Contentment is basically critical satisfaction. Now that word critical can sound bad, right? You know, talk about something critical and we think, you know, Robbie, I'm so critical of you, you know. Well, that's a, that could be a bad thing, right? I could be very critical. And Renee's going, no, that, that'd be good. Please be critical of Robbie, okay. Critical means we're examining. Complacency, uncritical satisfaction. Complacency says, I am not examining the circumstances that I am in. I am not looking at them in any way. I'm just accepting them. It's kind of like fatalism in a sense. Where contentment looks at our circumstances, our objects, whatever, with an evaluation. And there's a particular, for the Christian, there's a particular lens of evaluation that we need to embrace. And that's the lens of, is this what God wants? Is this what Jesus has for me? Complacency says, I'm just going to camp in the moment. I've got everything I need, and I really don't care about anybody else or anything. I'm just going to live right here. Contentment says, I'm going to live in the moment, but I'm going to continue to move forward for what God has for me. Contentment is also not having all you want. In Philippians 4.19, Paul says this, that may my God supply all your need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Notice it doesn't say according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. See, God is the one who determines what you and I need. And do we have enough trust in him to believe that 
he will take care of us. More on that a little bit later. Remember the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15? He thought he needed to get away, didn't he? He thought he needed to get that part of the inheritance and he needed to go out and experience the world and, and have all this fun that supposedly his father was keeping him from having. You know the story. He goes out, he does these things, he comes to a place of, of destitution, he comes to a place of brokenness, he comes to a place of, of, of total deprivation. And he realizes that's not what he wanted at all. That actually what he had in his father's house was exactly what he needed all the time. And so he says, I'm so ashamed. I'm not even worried to be called a son anymore. I'm going to go back and ask my father to hire me as one of his hired hands. So I can be at least a servant because at least I will have food. At least I will be able to eat. I'll have a place to sleep. I'll, I'll be taken care of better than eating this slop with the pigs in the pigsty. And you know the end of the story. He goes back and his father receives him as a son and welcomes him back into the family. Contentment is not based on outward circumstances. It's not fatalism. It's not complacency. And it's not having all we want. Then what is true contentment? First of all, true contentment has to take on heaven's view of our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 say this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We need to remember where our citizenship is. Philippians 3.20, a, a chapter back, Paul says this, that our citizenship is not on this earth, it's in heaven above. That is where we reside. That is our home. That is where we are on our way to. This is just a way stop along the way. An assignment that God has given to us while we're walking this earth to bring Him glory and honor and if so, to reach people for Christ so that they too may be saved and have the life abundant. Yeah. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he's reminding the Corinthians, hey, your job here is to be an ambassador for Christ. You are an ambassador. An ambassador does not live in the country that he or she is in, but they represent their king or their leader or their president, whoever it is. In our case, we represent King Jesus here. And so what is that representation that he wants out of your life and my life and those fears of influence that we have in our Jerusalem and our Judea at least, in our homes and our communities and places we work? And then for some of us, it's going on beyond that to Samaria, that outer regions and things, and then for some, it even goes further to the ends of the earth. And, and, and how... How do we fulfill that assignment? But we need to take heaven's view of our lives. That we're just here to bring him honor and glory and that he's going to take us. True contentment also only wants only what you have. Paul was content with what he had, although he did appreciate the gift that the Philippians sent him. He's chained to a guard for crying out loud in a, in a, in a house. And he can't go and, and come and go as he used to and, and pleased. But he was still content. Well, then what is that secret of contentment? If it's not being able to come and go as you please, it makes you content. If it's not being able to run down to the corner market, if it's not being able to do whatever, then, then what is it? True contentment not only involves taking heaven's view of our lives and only wanting what we have, but it also involves trust. It also involves trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Many of you know that's one of my favorite passages. I quote it often. Probably pretty much every sermon I ever preach, I quote that one. It's one of the first passages I ever memorized in vacation Bible school when I was 10 years old. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will set your paths straight. Do we trust the Lord enough to rest in him that where we are in our lives is, is where he wants us and what we have is what he wants us to have? Do we continue to go to him and say, Lord, am I where you want me to be? Do I have what you want me to have? Am I missing something here? Do we trust him enough to step out and do that? Do we have the trust of a Peter who had the trust in the Lord Jesus Christ when he called him out of the boat to walk on the water? Jesus Peter did it. And as long as he was focused on Jesus, what happened with Peter? He walked on the water. Right? But as soon as he got to looking at the waves and the circumstances around him, he got his eyes off Jesus and he sank. Jesus rescued him. And there is the good news of that too. But sometimes we will get our eyes on the circumstances. Don't let that scare you to death. Because Jesus will still rescue us out of that. He won't look at us and go, well, you took your eyes off me, good luck. He doesn't do that. He comes just like he did Peter, picks us up by the hand. When are you going to learn to trust me? He takes us back to the boat. The Bible tells us that God knows the plans that he has for us. Jesus has promised that he will never leave or forsake us. And he loves us so much that when he went to the cross and then ultimately to the grave and then rose from the grave and at the right hand of the Father, he didn't leave us as orphans, that he gave us the Holy Spirit. Another helper and comforter of the same kind that Jesus was. To be with us always, to live in us and to guide us. To help us understand how to be content in this life. So not only does it involve trust, but it relies on God's power. Relies on God's power. Second Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 say this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us some very great and precious promises. So that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. The verse is self-explanatory. God's divine power has given us everything. John 15, 5 tells us that apart from him, we can do nothing. And yet in Philippians 4, 13, what does Paul say? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Those two verses work together. And so we need to rely on God's power. True contentment also involves Caring for others. In verse 19, Paul tells them what he has experienced. He, he, actually, it's the whole chapter. And he, has, he has been telling them what he has experienced. And then he says in verse 19, and, and my God will supply all your needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He's saying to him, look, God has taken care of me. I've been content in all these things. He will take care of you too no matter what comes your way. He will supply all your needs. Trust him. He will do it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul, earlier on, gives the Philippians some encouragement about caring for others when he says this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus has. And he goes on to explain what Jesus did. That he went to the cross for us. That he took on our sins. That he paid the price. And that he was pleased to do that. So 
So we know what contentment basically, excuse me, is not, and we know what it is. How can we experience it? How can we have real contentment? First is this. Remember that everything belongs to God. What we have is a gift from Him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 tells us that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. That we are to glorify God then with our bodies. Not only are, do we remember that everything belongs to God, but we also need to be thankful for what you have. If you keep focusing on what you don't have, instead of what you have, if you keep focusing on what you haven't attained, as opposed to what you've experienced, discontent can creep in really quick. And it's easy to stop praising and stop celebrating what God is doing. Because we're spending all the time looking at the negative instead of the positive. I'm not saying ignore the negative. I'm saying don't camp in the negative. Put it before God. Deal with it. But let's celebrate the positive. There's, there's more to our lives. God knows what's going on. Do we trust him enough to do that? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Sometimes it's easier to give thanks in some circumstances than it is in others, isn't it? Sometimes it's really hard to give thanks in some circumstances. You know, James comes along and writes something like, uh, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. <laughs> thanks. But there's truth to that, isn't it? But sometimes it's really hard to get there. And God knows that. He's not surprised by that. He doesn't sit there up in heaven and go, I didn't see you were going to struggle with that. He knows. We just lay it at his feet. Be thankful for what we have. Here's one. Ask for wisdom to use wisely what we do have. James 1.5 tells us, If any of you lacks wisdom, let me ask God who gives liberally, abundantly. There's a lot of adjectives that various translations use here. The idea is God doesn't hold back. You want wisdom? You're going to give it. Wisdom, basically defined, is the right application of knowledge. Want to know what you're supposed to do with what you have? Want to know what you're supposed to do with this, this experience or this journey that you're on? Ask God. Probably harder for men than it is for women to do that because guys don't like to ask for directions. <laughs> you were thinking about the Home Depot incident the other day, I know. Ask her about it, she'll tell you. <laughs> Here's one. Pray for grace to let go of the desire for what we do not have. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 tell us this. Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's truth, folks. God does that. He pours out his peace on it when we take it to him. We have to be willing to receive it. Yes, sometimes it, it, it takes a while to come because we're so wrapped up in what's going on in the horizontal. We're so focused on it, and God's got to weed that out of us. But a promise is a promise, and he's faithful to his promises. And his peace will come. We just have to be able to see it from his perspective and receive it his way. And the last one, trust God to meet our needs. Matthew 6.33, most of you know this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you. What's he talking about these things in the verses before? He's talking about what food you're going to have, what shelter you're going to have, what clothes you're going to wear. God knows all those things, and he's going to take care of you. You can be content in life because God is going to take care of it. 
And then again, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in him, not in ourselves, not in our own understanding. So what's the secret for the relationship of contentment? What's the secret of contentment? It's a relationship with Jesus. It's really found in verse 13 of chapter 4. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The all things is referring back to the list in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 4. I've learned to be contented in plenty. I've learned to be contented in want and everything in between. I've been learned to be content in all things. Because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. See, Paul's focus and trust was in Jesus. He had a living and abiding relationship with Jesus, and he continued to grow in it. It started on Damascus Road, and it kept going up until his death. That is the same for us. The secret to contentment is cultivating that living, abiding relationship with Jesus continually. That's what he wants. As the worship team comes forward, let me share with you a passage that sums this up as well. It, Paul really uh, highlights what is special about contentment. He's writing to a young pastor named Timothy. And he is probably about 30 years old and he's pastoring a church at Ephesus. And Paul's writing to him to encourage him with some various instructions and things. and and. He wants to point out something to Timothy in his ministry about contentment. And he says this, follow along as I read. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 11. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. This was Paul's words to Timothy. It's his words to us. I believe it's what Jesus wants to say to us. That we need to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness because we can pursue those because he gives us strength. Amen.